to my New Zealand colleagues. So let me just, uh, thanks to whoever just turned recording on. Um, let me just quickly share one slide and then. Sorry, Andrew, I think Irina hasn't introduced herself. Uh, Irina was proposing to disappear very quickly because oh, okay. she needed to get some sleep. No, okay, Irina, please introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm just a tech support here, <laughs> but happy, happy to, to show my face. Many of you are familiar with myself, especially Stephanie. We used to work together during different time zones. Hi, Stephanie. Nice to see Hi. you. Hi. That must hurt, though, that time. It does. <laughs> <laughs> like too many of you. Yes, this plenary um, is trying to accommodate all time zones. However, um, it hurts some of the people, as we all know. Um, many of you know me. I am the person who's behind planning all of the plenary meetings for the RDA, and I work at the um, Secretariat, our core uh, department within the RDA here in Edinburgh. So yeah, it's quite early, and if everyone forgives me, I will disappear for an hour to rejoin everyone for the networking session starting at 5 UTC. So if you are still available, please join. Hopefully I'm not going to cancel it and my colleague will join. Um, good luck with the session and thank you very much for letting me to introduce myself. Okay, thanks Irina. Talk to you later, bye. Yeah. Bye. Um, so let me share one slide, uh, which is this one. So this is uh, advance notice of an event that's happening uh, late next year, uh, which is in our region. Uh, and I would strongly encourage my New Zealand colleagues uh, to, to come. International Data Week. So ARDC is uh, the, the lead organization for this and doing it in collaboration, very close collaboration with CoData, the World Data System and the Research Data Alliance. We're currently uh, in the throes of, of organizing this. Keith Russell, who's on this call, is chair of the organizing committee. I'm chair of the program committee. Um, there'll be more information coming out soon as we spin up the website for this, but I would strongly encourage you to, to mark your calendars for 13th to 16th of October. Um, the other event that Rosie's just reminded me about is happening this year uh, in Early December, is that right, Rosie? Third to the fifth of December is what is in my oh, head. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the International Conference on Research Infrastructures, which is a um, an invitation only meeting for people that around the world who are concerned about running large research infrastructures. But Rosie's just let me know that there's going to be virtual attendance as an option. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in research infrastructures, and I mean, who wouldn't be, then that's an opportunity for people that uh, don't get an invite to be able to, uh, to travel and take part. I've been to two ICRIs now, uh, and they are an excellent place to get a sense of what's happening in the research infrastructure space, not just digital research infrastructures, obviously, but physical research infrastructures as well. Although increasingly the physical have large and essential digital components to them. Is there anything, as, as someone who's helping organise that, Rosie, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I, I would, Andrew, thank you. Uh, and the reason I'm flagging it is we're still looking at uh, the themes um, and some of them are, are very much along the digital research infrastructure, but there are also three key challenges and I'm, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but very, very relevant for David, um, looking at the, oh. the yeah. So um, the, the reason I can't remember it is because they haven't set in stone, but if you were to take the feeding the planet theme um, as the, the current working title, we're looking at the environmental science, agriculture space, mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, it's with that head on, I think, um, flagging it for David particularly. Oh, the, yeah. Jacqueline, you... there is also a health stream as well. So don't feel left out. Um, so for Feeding the Planet, Rosie, is the International Rice Research Institute likely to get an invite? Or do you not know? I, I'm in the digital stream. 
I'm, uh, I'm okay. I'm right. only get, I think Hamish will end up in the planet one. Right. Uh, I'll dig out the ICRI link and dump it in chat as well. I think Claire's beat us. Thank you, Claire. Oh. I wanted to do it just to check that that was the right one that it was. Oh, I'll, ch I'll check now. I think uh, that's, that's from our website. But I, oh, no, that's so ours. So yeah. the, the, the other one is... That one. 2024, I think. Yeah. Yep, dot .au. And I don't think it will have a programme yet. No, no, it's a but work in progress. Certainly that register for more information, I think I would um, extend that to everybody. So you have a plethora of ARDC people to pepper with questions, should you wish to do so. Or not. If, if not, can I pepper people with questions as well? So sure. the background for that is I went to the um, interest group that is being created out of the former European Ambassadors Programme last night. And mm -hmm. they were quite keen on expanding whatever they do. So ambassador is probably not quite the right word because that implies, you know, one person owning a specific discipline or area or something like that. So there's there's some th some talk about that. What exactly what exactly that would mean? But they're looking at having people from specific disciplines doing things between RDA and the disciplines. And they are keen to expand from this formerly wholly European thing, which was actually funded to an unfunded global thing, whatever that thing might be. So there's still some room to shape it. And I was, I, I actually had some thoughts about what they might have to do to include other regions other than Europe. And I would be really keen on people's thoughts about what whether that would be of interest to you, whether that would be of interest to anyone you'd know, like to become an ambassador, well, ambassador is the wrong word. Uh, they haven't found a better better name, but maybe a liaison between um, RDA and disciplines, but also what would that need for you? Because they were talking about having sessions and meetings and things like that. And I was thinking, yeah, I can sort of see how that happens. It'll be at, you know, um, four o'clock in the afternoon UTC to encourage Europeans and Americans and anyone yeah. who suffers from insomnia in our region. So I yeah. actually flagged the fact that time zones are a big problem, but it would be really interesting to, to get your thoughts on what, whether you would see any benefit in something like that, what would be like, what would you like to see and what kinds of, what kinds of barriers we would need to overcome with something like that, if that makes sense. So, so that's a bit so what's, a spontaneous thought. Okay, so it sounds like a better name might be something like Discipline Data Champion, but but that's possibly yeah. wrong too. What's the problem they're trying to solve? Um, that's a very good question. So I, it's full disclaimer, I only attended their session. I have nothing to do with them. Um, but I think they're trying to in a way, continues some of the, what they see as good work they've done with disciplines and mm -hmm. make it more open because this was a funded program. There was an applications process and people got selected, et cetera, et cetera. So they don't want to do any of that. But they also recognize that, of course, you know, take any discipline, the chances of that being a purely European discipline are pretty remote. So you will always have to deal with people worldwide. Mm -hmm. And the best people to connect into those disciplines may not be in Europe. So that's good that they've worked that out. But um, the question then is, you know, what could, what would be a good way of, because this has this core European focus from this funded program, what could they do to, to really broaden that and make it truly global, not just European, and we have to add a couple other people in? Does that yeah. make sense? Uh, it, it makes sense. I guess my question would be who who is going to support it, who's going to drive it, who's going to make it happen, given that the, the, the central funding to enable that 
has gone away. You'd need to find someone or some group of people in each discipline that cared about it uh, and that felt it was adding value to whatever their mm -hmm. existing discussions were. I think that's what they're trying to do with this interest group. Mm. So funding or sort of some kind of support would be one thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, support or someone with three hours in their life that they can devote to doing that. Or intangible incentives like reputation or whatever, if that's of use to the person, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I'm wondering, David, you, you played a, a slightly similar role doing, doing very specific work for a discipline, developing the standards, thinking about the data standards in that space. What was your experience trying to pull that together and running that across time zones? Oh, nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that good. Yeah, so we've done some stuff on kind of global interoperability around source stuff, um, driven out of some RDA uh, initiatives. Uh, yeah, it was it. It was a, there was a lot of time trying to spend everybody understanding what everybody else was doing, uh, particularly between sort of Europe, America, and Australia and New Zealand. Um, but certainly, there was a real challenge around trying to work because we were actually doing um, pro code development and setting up sort of pro a proof of concept infrastructure, and um, it, it was hard. Um, and it was being done on a bit of an oily rag as well, which didn't help. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, trying to have technical conversations where you were trying to actually do code development at the same time and get systems to work. You know, so you're actually four, four, con well, four countries. Uh, no, actually, because the Italians were involved as well. So five countries trying to actually work together in a kind of live development space in different time zones. Yeah. Yeah. Did you use any more, like a lot of asynchronous means of communicating? Like, I don't know, Slack or shared documents and things like that. Did, did, did you find anything there that worked really well? Um, yeah. No, not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, the part of the problem was we, we had quite a lot of arguments. <laughs> <laughs> in the meetings exactly about um, how things should be done and it, it really required a face-to-face -face conversation to get everybody to understand and New Zealand and Australia were bringing quite complex soil, info, uh, soil data models which the mm -hmm. Europeans and Americans hadn't really seen before so there was a lot of conceptual discussions which really only worked if you could have um, virtual face-to-face -face. Uh, you know and you had white mm -hmm. whiteboards that people could draw stuff on and try to explain it um i mean this was quite a long time ago this is 2015 2016 i think we did mm -hmm. i mean it worked in the end we actually had a quite a good demo uh which we ended up demonstrating to part of the fao um as a proof that you could actually if you really invested in it produce a sort of global soil infrastructure soil data infrastructure um yeah Mm. Uh, a proof of concept that didn't go any further. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The FA in that instance, the FAO, it ran into FAO politics where the FAO felt they should be doing it and didn't like the fact that um, it was being laid in the air. When we had meetings with the FAO on this, it always had to be at two o'clock Italian time. Great. <laughs> because that was FAO sort of policy around things. So that was great for the Europeans, not so great for the Aussies and ourselves. Yeah, indeed. Has anyone tried um, rotating time zones? Because I think um, then it's sort of sharing the pain aspect rather than it's always the same group, um, which sounds good in principle, but I've not, I've not been part of a group that's done it regularly. And I don't know if it just means you you end up with alternating, not having groups of people there. So I'm, I'm curious if anyone's had 
um, ha had this work or, or not. Yeah, we tried so, that, and you're right. People didn't turn up. The Americans wouldn't turn up because it didn't wasn't convenient for them. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Keith and I are both having this experience at the moment with international committees where the Australians are chairing it. Uh, and yet it's still difficult to find times where people will turn up. Uh, complicated by the fact that for one of those committees, at least we have people on the West Coast of the United States, which just makes it even harder. Um, but tempting as it is to say, we're going to do it in Australian time zones, damn it. Uh, it, it doesn't work internationally if you want the, the internationals to turn up. And the unpleasant reality based on a decade of doing this sort of stuff, well, more than a decade, but a decade in RDA, is that people in our part of the world are used to crap times and have a relatively high tolerance for it. Or, or there's a process of Darwinian selection. And if you don't like doing video conferences at midnight, you just move into another job. Um, whereas the Europeans and the Americans are totally used to having meetings at times that work for both sides of the Atlantic. What's the problem? Hmm. Uh, and it's just, it's just hard. Yes, um, and I think the Techno Advisory Board, for example, has tried to have two meetings, so to accommodate different time zones. And guess yes. what? Um, you know, it's the, the, the people showing up to those, the numbers tend to be quite bad. So um, it's not great. And also then you have the added coordination effort between the meetings, which is not so fantastic yeah. either. At yeah. least yeah, that's I mean, how it went a couple of years ago. Yeah, when I was co-chair of TAB and we tried that, you essentially ended up with two different technical advisory boards with not a lot of overlap, uh, which is not the uh, not what you're looking for. And I'm trying to wonder if I may. So we all know about that problem. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like us to think a little bit differently and, and reflect that it is only ANZ here today and these hours mm -hmm. are good for a lot of other people um, and how if we're thinking about really amplifying the effect of RDA uh, in even in the the discipline context that Stephanie has has given us as a challenge we should be having lots more of our neighbors in these conversations um, why aren't we managing to do that um, it's not a trick question. I really want to know the answer. <laughs> How so, Claire, David, um, Jackie? What are your links in the right time zone, and how can we get them to come and play with us? Claire, well, uh, Claire, I, I kind of think RDA doesn't really have a lot of visibility in New Zealand. Um, I, I kind of was there for my historic reasons, really. Um, Claire, what do you think? So, sorry, I know you, we can talk about the Pacific Islands and so on, but it, even just in the context, we haven't got many mm. people here from New Zealand. Sure. No, oh, Claire, you're muted, I think. No. Maybe select your microphone again. No. Okay, we're getting good at lip reading. <laughs> I guess the other comment while Claire's trying to do that is um, from New Zealand's perspective, a lack of Maori representation here is pretty noticeable as well, given yeah. uh, how important that, uh, that group is now in New Zealand. Um, but I, I don't quite know how, how we would get into that group really. Which group is this? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Maori in general. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so I guess going back a step on, on RDA, I think you're right, David, we have a very low, um, low awareness. And yet actually, when you look at membership, uh, both at an institutional and at a, you know, sort of an organizational and at a individual, the membership's relatively high relatively mm. um but i think we've i think we've got over 300 members or something which probably for the size of our industry you know for, for the size of our sector is not actually bad and yet you know this is the first i'm pretty sure the first rda meeting i've been on in this you know fellow kiwi 
and and David, I'm sure you're probably the same that you know there's not a lot of overlap, I don't think generally. So I'm not sure if it's historic membership and there's not a lot of participation now or um yeah i'm 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 not sure i think we started and we've had a few conversations haven't we started sort of talking about trying to build a bit more community around um sort of australia and new zealand and, and we've got got no further than sort of starting to talk about it i think so um... yeah and, and and rosie's point i think which is a good one is that and that's a that's only a very small part of the pie in terms of this region uh, and indeed a very Anglo-centric part of the pie. Yeah. Uh, Keith, um, and then oh. Stephanie. Ooh, I think Leslie had her hand up before me, actually. Oh, okay, Leslie. Um, hi, I'd just like to comment that... Um, oh, Les sorry, Leslie, can you step back a bit from your microphone? You sound like you're really, really... Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm having trouble with my side book. Sorry, can you side voice maybe? Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, we could always hear you. It's whether we could recover our hearing after we heard you. Sorry, this morning people couldn't hear me, so it's I'm not quite sure what's going on. Um, I just wanted to say that my observation, um, I'm glad David's here, is that Australia New Zealand attendance in RDA, particularly in the Earth Environmental Sciences, is just dropping, um, particularly since COVID. And um, with, I read a session last night on the care principles as applied to physical samples, and we did try to engage the um, New Zealand group, but again, because we'd got that midnight time slot, it didn't get anyone. So, um, I'm just not sure what to do with it because it's not just RDA, it's a lot of other things as well that um, Australians are just not participating in our research data, data infrastructures. It's even happening with like the groups I'm involved in, in informatics in EGU and AGU and we've just never recovered our um, pre-COVID numbers of participation either virtually or in person. Uh, Keith, did you want to talk about our new hire who is magically going to, going to solve this problem for us? <laughs> you spotted it perfectly. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so one thing that we uh, we did have uh, and started work on probably about two years ago was having a, a regional, com sort of, yes, basically a community manager based in Australia, an RDA community manager based in Australia to facilitate conversations in this time zone. Um, um, that went through a bit of a, a lull and we are now recruiting a new person and that person will be recruited through Curtin University. So the ad's gonna go out in the next, actually hopefully in the next week or so. Uh, so we're really excited uh, um, to, to, to hopefully get a, a great person in that role. And that will allow us to run more events and webinars and activities in this time zone. And we've consciously called the person a regional the community manager it's very much focused on the region and when we say the region we're thinking not only Oceania um, I think it's great that we have this Oceania office hour session but we could have made this the East Asia Oceania office hour session because we are in the same time zone uh, and I think we're definitely when this person comes on board going to look at the opportunities to bring in more of East Asia too. Thanks, Keith. Uh, Stephanie, you're on mute. Sorry. And we can now all take um, that off on our Zoom bingo card. Yes. Um, following on from what Keith just said, so a few years ago when I was still um, Director of Operations for RDA, I did a bit of that on the side. So we organized events following from virtual plenaries or from plenaries recognizing that a lot of people might be interested in the topics but would not be willing to attend a plenary at yeah that was basically set in costa rica or edinburgh um so we what we did was we tried to organize a couple of sessions following the plenary with some topics that were discussed at the plenaries with basically regional attendance 
<clears throat> the first time we did that, or I did that, it was actually an idea from Jens Klump. So credit where credit's due. The first time I organized that, it was pretty much flat. There wasn't much happening. Mm -hmm. The second time we promoted it better and got quite good attendance of between 50, 30 to, six, 30 to 50, 60 people per session, which was great. Um, so I don't know if that's sort of like creating more of a hub thing that could be bringing some of the information from the bigger RDA events into the region, whether that would be something we could look at again, whether that would be of interest to people. Or it's certainly something we could ask. Yeah, it's certainly something we could ask the new new person to look at um, around the Costa Rica event, where I suspect uh, perhaps not so many people from Australia and, and New Zealand and East, well, maybe East Asia uh, are likely to attend. So maybe uh, maybe something the, along the lines you've described there is something we could offer. I don't know. Would that be of, like Claire, David, Jackie, do you think that would be of interest to people that you know? Or to your community? I've, yeah, look, my thoughts on this um, is that people are constantly being asked to attend things and th these events will cost money. So even, for example, today, to be able to be on the, um, you know, to be a presenter and talk, you know, I've had to pay to have um, attendance at the event. And I think, you know, we are, we know that we're all, financially stretched at the moment I think you know it's it's tricky when there's so many events we want to go to um, mm -hmm. we also have limited budgets um, that you know if you can create a way for people to engage in the space without needing to pay to come to this event you might get more engagement mm -hmm. um, the other thing comment I wanted to make as well is that you know I'm here and I'm an academic at a university and whenever I attend the RDA events I'm one of very few academics online it's often ARDC people it's ISC people it's you you know it's people that are kind of in the working groups and so mm -hmm. it's it, you, it's not these um RDA um plenary sessions and what there's two a year or something or thereabouts um yeah, yeah they, they don't seem to from where i'm positioned to kind of attract people outside of those already working in the space mm -hmm. so i'm often one of the only people particularly from the health space um i'm often one of the only kind of you know, when I look through the attendees list, um, one of the people on the other side using data, there's often lots of data um, custodians, you know, based at unis or people that are the, um, the data, the data holders or the, you know, librarians and people that are looking after the infrastructure, but it, there's not from where I see it that many uh, there's definitely a smaller proportion of attendees at this event that um, are people actually using the data and understanding how their data is stored and how they can get access to it. And I think that's probably where the gap is at the moment. I have to say, if I didn't come to these events and I didn't, I wasn't part of the broader CoData ISC kind of group, and I, I probably wouldn't even know that what ARDC do or what RDA is or, you know, and even though I come to these things, to be honest, I still don't quite get it. Um, so there definitely needs to be someone, like it's a mate, like it sounds great, you're employing someone to basically do what I was going to suggest, which is that we need, you just need to engage more across the um, to kind of raise awareness. And I know you have your email, like I get your ARDC email every, whenever it comes through and I read it and I kind of think, oh, is any of that related to me, relevant to me? It sort of sounds like it's technical jargon that's done by someone else. And I sort of just then put it into a folder in case I need it down the track, but never quite sure. 
So I'm, I'm being a little bit pessimistic, but I'm doing that on purpose because um, I just, if I was to talk to any of my colleagues in the corridor about ARDC, I don't think they would have any idea about who you are or what, what you do. Um, and yet they use data and they use the platforms that you look after and that you're providing governance and advice about how they should be handled and the fair and all of these kinds of practices that we're trying to engage in. So I just, yeah, I'm being a bit pessimistic and a bit, you know, well, do doomy gloomy, but I think it, it is important from where I sit, that's, that's the academics and the other side. So, yeah. Anyway, that's Andrew. what, that, they're my thoughts <laughs> at the moment. Andrew, if I may? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Jackie, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Can I get you to come and say it to our comms group as well, please? Um, because this is something I'm really passionate about. In the conferences, we're preaching to the choir. Mm. And so what we need to do is we need to put the researcher at the center of our focus. Um, and because it's a small group and because we're all friends, Andrew, we can't miss this chance to show Jackie the RDC format. You have a slide. Okay. This is the future, all right? Okay. I just, I I can get, so Claire knows this. Claire's heard me present this before. Claire could probably give my talk. Um, but uh, go for it, Andrew. <laughs> the RDC format or the, the, do you mean the weave and weft diagram? Well, you're, whatever's in your slides, in your prep for today. Yeah, well, the, you made me take out the really cool slides because they haven't been approved yet. Um, uh, well, this is a safe space. I won't tell anyone. I don't have <laughs> anyone to tell. Uh, I, um, it is being recorded. <laughs> oh, yes, it, it is. is, isn't it? Okay. Um, um, but, thanks, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, the cons we always have to be consumer facing in whatever we do. So, you know, in my research, I have to think about my consumers that are going to be using the research that I produce or the work. I think for ARDC, you need to think about, well, who are your consumers? Who are you doing this for? And it's academics and scientists and the people that are using the data. So I think you just need to find out better ways to engage with those people. Um, and, I, you know, every time I get a survey from you, uh, and I say you collectively, um, I always fill it in, um, but I just, you know, yeah, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I'm on board. I'm part of yeah. the, um, you know, like you said, preaching to the converted. So, you know, how do you think, we have to think about how we engage with those people who don't know uh, about yeah. the resource. Yeah. Yeah, and I think part of the answer is, I, I won't show the slide because it is just the warp and weft slide, Rosie. Okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to get you. Part of the answer for, okay, part of the answer for us is that we are focusing what we do in the ARDC around. Uh, you see, that was the one I wanted to use, but you told me to take it out. Um, that we're focusing that what one's approved. Um, it's been there for ages. Uh, okay, we're focusing what we're trying to do around meeting the needs of specific groups of researchers. And so the three that uh, Rosie's got on the screen at the moment. People as health and medical data, directly relevant to your world, uh, Jacqueline, um, where we have Health Data Australia now as one of the first deliverables out of that, and where we're deliberately trying to meet the needs of people who use health data as well as people that worry about health data. We've got the Planet Research Data Commons, which is focused on earth and environmental sciences at the moment with a particular emphasis on, emphasis on eco-informatics. And we have um, the humanities, arts and social sciences and indigenous research data commons, which is focused on, as you might expect, on humanities, arts, social science researchers with a particular focus on, on indigenous data. And in fact, indigenous data issues runs across all three of those. So these are much more user focused uh, or user oriented uh, infrastructure activities 
working very closely with the researchers to co-design the solutions and provide enduring infrastructure that's going to meet their needs. That's a tick. That's a pass, Andrew. Well, you know, thank you. Wow. Pass on a pass fail scale. My goodness, if I don't give him high distinction, I'll be pulled up on it. That's a high distinction. Um, but the, <laughs> point, the point is, uh, I'm really recognising what Jackie's saying. Uh, and I yep. think this is absolutely critical for all of us that are working in the provision of data infrastructure. There was a time when the the choir, as we've christened it, was exactly the right group as we were really seeking innovation, doing lots of proof of concepts, and it was about testing whether things could be done. What we have to do now is we have to provide robust, reliable, high technology readiness level research infrastructure and reach your colleagues, Jackie. You know, so anytime you want one of us to go over to Flinders and present the planet or the sorry, the people RDC, yep. sing out and we'll be there in a heartbeat. Sorry about that, Keith, just volunteering us. No, no, no. And I, 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 totally, I, I, I totally I'm happy to do it. My mother lives at Celex Beach. <laughs> Um, I guess and, and the broader point, Jacqueline, is that we, we most of the people who work for the ARDC care about the data stuff um, in the same way that people who build roads care about gravel and bitumen consistency. I mean, there are conferences for people that build roads and worry about gravel and bitumen. And yet most people just want to drive a car from point A to point B. And I think what we need to do is we need to make sure that at least part of our messaging is here are some wonderful ways you can drive your research data car mangling the metaphor now from point a to point b where point a is where you are now and point b is the next nature paper uh, and focus perhaps a little bit more on that um, and perhaps a little bit less on the plumbing which we care passionately about and which needs to be cared about but uh, possibly is of less interest to the great bulk of researchers Yeah, sorry, I, I think, think you, you um, oh, sorry, I was gonna say, yes, I, I agree. I think, you know, we, we need to appreciate that as academics, as people that use data, as scientists, we need to appreciate there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens behind the scenes and have an appreciation of what that is, but um, mm. also understand, you know, the end user and, and how, you know, we're actually using the data as well. Yeah. Yeah, and Keith's dropped a useful link in chat uh, talking about resources for researchers. Um, if you like, providing a, a researcher perspective on the things that we do. Stephanie? So it just occurred to me that what we've been talking about is exactly the same problem that RDA has been talking about with the ambassadors. Mm -hmm. um, so we need RDC ambassadors. So we need people linking us with real life researchers and getting them to maybe spread the word a bit more. Yeah, and uh, Keith, of course, this is your problem. Uh, so I'm glad you got your hand up. Sorry, it's all of our problems, Rosie, I accept that. No, I think actually it's a, this is a useful discussion and a, a very recognizable discussion. We have been trying to pivot the, uh, not only the communication, but also the focus of ARDC and what we're actually delivering to highlight that we're actually delivering things for researchers and delivering things that researchers can use and making them more findable. So one of the pieces of work is that is that link there, uh, which shows a, a series of resources for researchers. Uh, the other thing we are, we're quite aware of is that um, the usual conferences and the usual channels are often the people that uh, care about the plumbing and uh, mm. are generally not attended by so many researchers. So it's much more useful to go to where the researchers are, so discipline conferences, et cetera. So we're starting to do that, but I think there's a long, there's a, there's a, um, uh, definitely a, a further way to go there, and um, there's a lot more opportunity there. Uh, Stephanie, I think your comment about ambassadors uh, in the disciplines, I think it's a, it's a really good point and um, something um, that we've... Probably, if you look at the Hassan Indigenous um, uh, Research Data Commons, 
you're starting to see that happening uh, in in several ways in that there are some key researchers in that space that are um, are speaking on behalf of the projects and the things that have been delivered in that space. And I think that's a model we we might want to explore further for the um, the, uh, the 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 people and the planet research data commons, which uh, were started a bit later than the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons. So there, are, um, um, I think there's probably some lessons learnt to that to be learned across those. Might be useful to have a look at the RDA um, ambassadors program that they used to have that was run through Europe and just see what did they actually want their ambassadors to do. And I'm sure there's also some reporting on what worked, what didn't, that might be useful stuff that could be transferable. Could right. not be, an RDA? Might be worth... Right. Sorry. That wasn't part of RDA Tiger, was it? That was a separate no, project? No, that's not Tiger. Um, so that was a separate project that I think finished last year, but I couldn't swear to it. Um, I can dig out some information for you if that's useful. Um, because uh, I'm sure if, I could probably yeah. find it, but thanks. Yeah, cool. Um, there was in the session yesterday, there were a couple of references mentioned, so I could at least pull those out. Again, it may not be useful, but it's always nice to, to see what others have done and what may or may not have worked and under what circumstances. Uh, I actually have a question for Claire, because Claire, how's Nessie doing this? Because Nessie, you you're reaching out to researchers you i think you you actually provide direct services in the form of supercomputers but uh... yeah so we we do um yeah have that i guess direct user interaction i think we do a lot with kind of carpentries and community training as well um and that's sort of broader than just um you know how to use nessie services um that's that's much more around uh both general um i guess more more general compute skills and and um, languages Python and so on, um, as well as more discipline centric, um, you know, single cell running a single cell course recently. So I think that that's probably those two methods are our a, a lot of our um, uh, main ways. And then we do we do try and do a lot of comms within I guess within the um, capacity or that we that we have really um so again you know like you we have a newsletter and so on but i think probably it's that the advantage of having that direct user interaction um and, and training is probably where the bulk of that relationship i think comes in rather than it being a a one-way communication stream um that 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 really kind of allows for that i think mm. um We've got five minutes to go and Rosie and I at least have got another meeting that's starting on the hour. Uh, are there any last, oh, thanks Stephanie for the session notes from the session yesterday. Um, any last comments or questions before we, uh, we wrap this up? I, I guess that I have a question which I was gonna to direct to Rosie, but maybe I should direct to you. I mean, what does success look like? Oh. I've got to answer that oh, one. Rosie, Rosie's, Rosie's taken that one. Yeah. Success um, is not that we're super busy, not that we build loads of things, not that things are even running, but success is we build something and lots of researchers are using it. Okay, so that's interesting because I was going to ask numbers. An impact. I, didn't, I, I didn't want to ask numbers because people get a bit narky about numbers. But I mean, if you look at the total um, research population in Australia in terms of FTEs, I mean, how many would you be wanting to use ARD services for it to be considered successful? Because my right. concern is there's a lot of scientists that are nowhere near ready, and that's the problem here. I mean, the ones I'm having to deal with in our organisation are so lacking in basic research data management skills that they can't even think about going into the sorts of infrastructures. I have two conversations. I have a conversation out with people like you, which is like the stuff I think we should be doing. And I turn around and I've got people who don't even understand what metadata is. Right? Yeah. And I okay. just think so that's such a big gap. Yeah. yeah, I'll answer that. Um, and David, I am super happy to continue this discussion at some other point because you can see that this is an absolute trigger button for me. Um, we have about 75,000 researchers in Australia. 
in designing the people, planet and has, we are aiming to capture 75% of those researchers. We're not focusing on astronomers, for example. Um, we are moving away from the notion we're going to support everyone in the first instance. And we're thinking on you know, how many health and medical researchers have we got? Um, it's about, it's, it's a huge percentage, we say 30,000. Uh, we have at the moment 3,000-ish users of the Nectar Research Cloud that we can track well. Um, in other research infrastructures, so I ran the nanoscience and nanofab for 12 years, we were around two and a half thousand. That is so specialized, I would posit that 3,000 on the Nectar Research Cloud is way too low. So this is what I'm really, really pushing people for at the moment. Um, but what we're looking at doing is how we use persistent identifiers, such as you know, obviously the, the ORCID in this instance, to really get a much better understanding of who is using the system. And then you can use that to find out what have they published as a result. You know, that's the first one we can find. Um, it's a really important journey. You're right in saying that people get narky. We're not able to do it right now, but what we are doing and is standing up and saying, we've got to get better at measuring who's using this and be prepared to shut things down or converge on a platform to actually achieve something we think is giving us an appropriate return on investment. So we're at the start of that journey, but we're not shying away from it. Okay, yeah, happy to continue. My background is in providing data services, so I've had that experience of how do you get uptake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, David. I think that's a great thing to keep keep the lines of communication open on. Um, if you're interested, right. there's a session on Tuesday. Um, we're running an in, we're trying to start an interest group on understanding the uptake of digital research infrastructure. Even more shameless plug. I'm doing a lightning talk at it. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, um, uh, Rosie and I are, are really going to have to go um, to, in fact, to do some planning to deliver impact for researchers. So what could be more important? So thank you all for joining. Uh, I hope this was useful and or interesting. Um, and uh, we hope to see you around at future events. Don't forget ICRI this year, International Data Week next year. Lovely to see you, Claire. Lovely to meet Jackie and David. Bye. 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 See you okay, all. Thanks. Bye. See ya.